Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar. We are delighted that so many of you have, have signed up, which shows us how much interest there is in this topic of, of applying market systems approaches to the health sector. I can see more and more people are, are, are joining now, uh, and they'll miss my first couple of words, but there's some great content, so I get to all of that. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the Beam Exchange, we are a new global knowledge platform for market systems practitioners. Our goal is to improve and extend the application of market systems approaches. Through our website, social media, workshops and events, we aim to support development practitioners who, who work in market systems. I, I'm Ashley Ahrens, and I lead Beam's work on policy and practitioner learning. I'm very happy to lead you through this, our first webinar to look beyond agriculture and finance to innov innovation in non-traditional practitioner sectors. I'm especially happy that today we have three experts on health services and market systems approaches especially that they are here when they're a little bit sick. Um, I've received a message that I cannot be heard. Another message would be good as well. Um, but otherwise, I will take you through some information. This event is intended to be interactive. And I would like to ask you to use the chat box to ask any questions you have. You send questions to staff in your chat box to ask any questions to, to the presenters. We will pick these up and try to answer them during the Q&A session in the second half of the webinar. If we ask your question, we will say your name, so please include in a question if you want to be anonymous. If anything is not working technically, please use the chat box as well to contact Beam Exchange, as I just have. Um, we also invite you to give us your feedback about this event so that we can continue to improve our webinars. We'll provide you with a link to a short survey with a few brief questions about the webinar, which should only take a few minutes. There'll also be a recording of this event, so you can listen to it again and again if you would like, or recommend it to your colleagues and friends. Now to our presenters. Thomas Feeney, joining us from the UK, joined MDY Legal in January 2012 after working as a consultant in countries such as Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India and Senegal for a range of development organizations, including UNICEF, JICA, Save the Children, Plan, and Child International. His work has been published widely in development books and journals. Thomas is currently a program manager at MDY Legal, where he leads the Secretariat for Hanshep, and he will outline to us all the reality of health markets and introduce Hanshep and the new exciting health systems hub. Ron Ashkin, following next and calling from Kenya, is the team leader of PSP for H, which is implemented by Cardinal Emerging Markets from which most of the text introduced in this, web this webinar is gratefully drawn. He is a proven leader of large, innovative, complex entrepreneurial in initiatives, including those incorporating market systems approaches, which benefit the poor for funding agencies such as DFID, USAID, the EU, and the World Bank. He has pioneered use of the M4P approach in non-traditional sectors and instigated the integration of the Do No Harm conflict-sensitive framework into economic competitiveness programs. He will provide some insights based on the work in Kenya of the Private Sector Innovation Programme for Health. Last, but by no means least, Dr. Kolawole Maxwell, currently in Nigeria, is the Country Director of Malaria Consortium, providing support and oversight to the Malaria Consortium Programme portfolio in Nigeria, including the commercial sector component of UK AID funded SUNMAP. Before this, he worked at SUNMAP as Deputy Programme Director and later Programme Director. The commercial sector approach of SunMap is one of Malaria Consortium's approaches to developing markets for health commodities, and he will outline this work to develop a health commodity market of long-lasting insecticidal nets in Nigeria. Following their presentations, we will have around 30 minutes for questions and answers. We've received some, some very interesting questions so far, and then again, I encourage everyone to ask questions for the presenters in the chat box. Now I'd like to hand over to you, Tom. Great, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, I'm just going to move on my slides. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Feeney, and uh, as Ashley explained, I am the program manager for a consortium of donors and developing country governments called Hanshep. Um, I'll talk a little bit um, about Hanshep and why it was created in a moment, as well as uh, introduce the concept of health markets and some of the tools that are available to help us understand how public and private actors can work together more efficiently for shared health goals. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Health Systems Hub, which is a, a new online platform 
specially designed to make the best quality resources on this issue easily accessible and it's a great place where you can learn a lot more about the latest trends and who's working in this space. So let's kick off with a quick introduction to HANSHEP. Uh, this is another of those wonderful development acronyms that actually stands for Harnessing Non-State Actors for Better Health for the Poor. And you can see our mission statement on the slide at the top and our current members uh, just below it. So Henship was actually formed back in 2010 by a group of donors and developing country governments who all shared an interest in improving the performance of the non-state sector in health. And basically it works in two ways. Uh, one of which is to coordinate and align the approaches of these development actors so that they can learn from each other and reduce duplication in their work. And the second is partnering with each other to co-finance new and innovative models, harnessing non-state actors or the private sector to generate new knowledge about how public and private can work together more effectively. Now, Hanship currently has around 14 programs within its portfolio. Um, and I'll mention the most relevant of these a little later on but you can find out a lot more uh, by visiting the Hanship website and the link there at the bottom. So one of the reasons why Hanship was created was because of changing understandings around how health systems operate. Uh, for a long time, as you can see here, this was the dominant model of health. A publicly delivered system with three neat progressive stages of primary, secondary, and tertiary care, all with very simple, clear, linear pathways of referral between them. However, the reality, as I'm sure you would all know, is much more complex um, because patients now have access to a wide range of non-state actors, health providers, outside the public sector, and their path for seeking health products and services will be influenced by all sorts of factors, including provider affordability, um, location, access, geography, etc. So the linear pathway on which a lot of health policy is still made no longer exists in reality. In fact, research has suggested that in many regions of the world, private actors are often the first point of call for patients seeking health products and services. And this is true for both the poor and the wealthy in both urban and rural communities. So the chart you're looking at there displays health seeking behavior for outpatient services around the world. And you can see that private providers are the first point of contact for the majority of people in South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, North Africa and Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, of course, if you did the same kind of chart with inpatient services um, within hospitals, you would actually see a, a stronger skew towards the public sector. But even so, it's worth remembering that in countries such as India, 65% uh, of hospital beds are still private. So what does this mean? Well, in most countries, it means that when we talk of health systems, what we're actually talking about is health markets. Uh, a very complex mix of interactions with patients buying all different kinds of products and services from a wide range of public and private providers. Now it's worth noting that the term private is not always helpful in this discussion uh, because it's often understood as referring to those large for-profit or commercial providers such as the big hospital chains or pharmaceutical companies that we all know well. In reality, the majority of healthcare providers are actually non-state small to medium enterprises, or SMEs, and they include NGOs, um, community-based organizations, and faith-based organizations, which deliver a lot of healthcare in Africa, for example. Um, and it also includes um, a lot of individuals, frontline workers, such as drug sellers, pharmacists, midwives, and traditional healers. And you can see some of those examples listed there. So what this means is that all of this complexity means that improving healthcare outcomes for a population will require lots of different forms of collaboration and coordination 
and regulation between all of these different actors that are making up a health market. And it also means that we need to think very carefully about how governments and donors and other actors design their health interventions so that their impact or success is not undermined by other forces or actors operating in the market or that they uh, result in unintended negative consequences. Now as the Beam Exchange website, which I'm sure many of you will have looked at already, um, as that website shows, applying a market-based approach to development has already been around for quite a while in a number of other sectors, um, including agriculture, for example. And there are a few high-level frameworks available, such as the Making Markets Work for the Poor, or M4P, approach. But health markets are particularly complex. And for this reason, uh, DFID, uh, which is the UK Development Agency, part of the government, and the World Bank recently collaborated through Hanship to adapt the M4P framework specifically for health sector interventions. And they've called this new framework M4H, or Markets for Health. Now this framework includes tools to help you understand the market forces at work in different health markets. And uh, I'm just looking on the left-hand side here under market forces. And you have things like social funding or insurance, um, the level of customer competition for different products and services. Um, these are different factors that are operating in the market that can help you understand where the market is failing and where your intervention will have the most impact. On the right hand side you can see the government tools that are part of this M4H framework and they include different financial tools um, such as government contracting out of services to the private sector, voucher schemes that I'm sure many of you would be familiar with through social franchising, um, different taxes, loans and grants, but also regulatory tools that are available for governments to use in influencing the impact of these market forces. Now I don't have time to go into each of these in much detail now, but I'll direct you at the end of this short presentation to where you can study these tools and forces in more detail later, because they are all now freely available. Now at present, Hanship is supporting three interventions that use a mix of these market forces and government tools to try to actively improve different health markets and encourage better health outcomes for consumers. So these include the M4H training course that I just referred to, and you can see a little description of it on the left there. Uh, they also include the African Health Markets for Equity program, and this is bringing together both demand and supply side interventions targeting reproductive health and priority diseases. And it's also bringing together around six different implementing partners, uh, which you can just about make out in the logo there, um, working across Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. The third program is about improving the market demand and supply of zinc ORS medicine in Nigeria where, as you would be aware, thousands of children continue to die from diarrhea-related diseases that could otherwise have been prevented with access to this remedy. So again, I won't have time to go into each of these in more detail, but if you would like to know more, please just go to the Hanship website at the bottom, www.hanship.org, and you'll find more information on each of those programs. Okay, my time is up. But I wanted to just quickly um, give you some information on the new Health Systems Hub that was launched by Hanshep in October last year. And this is a new online platform where you can find a whole range of quality resources on health markets and other health system related topics that have been specially selected by global experts. Uh, we know how time poor everyone is in this business. so. Um, to help you get to the best resources more quickly, uh, this is a platform that we've developed specifically for that purpose. Um, it also includes the Connect section, which is a global directory of organizations and individuals specializing in different areas, and this can help you find out who's working on what issue in your country and internationally. And we also have um, an area called Collaborate, where 
we host online communities of practice focusing on different topics. And of relevance to this particular webinar, there are two groups that you can join. One is the Markets for Health group, where you can access all of the training resources that were developed by DFID and the World Bank. And also the M4P in Health group, uh, that's run by Ron Ashkin, who's the speaker just after me. Finally, there is a section on news. So to help you keep up to date with everything, uh, you can sign up as a member of the Hub, and you will have the latest news on different topics of your interest delivered directly to your inbox plus a selection of interviews with leading experts on different aspects of health systems, and also very handy little topic guides which provide an introduction to some of the most difficult and complex topics within health systems. So uh, hopefully you will have visited or you've heard of the Health Systems Hub already, but if you haven't, please do take time to have a look, sign up, it's totally free, and uh, you'll find a lot more information, including many of the resources that we'll refer to today on that Health Systems Hub. So I will stop there, I'm conscious of time, and I'm now going to pass to Ron Ashkin. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, that was a very insightful presentation. Uh, please bear with me, I've got a head cold, my voice is a little bit rough today. But I hope you can hear me. If not, send a message through the chat box. I'll, I'll try to respond there. But I think I can make it through 10 minutes. Um, I'd also like to thank Ashley and the Beam Exchange for inviting me to present on behalf of PSP4H. Uh, Ashley was particularly helpful in, in preparing us for this. I also thank everyone for participating. It's a great technology that brings stakeholders together from all over the world. I, I looked at the list, and we've got people both in front of us and behind us in, in time zones. So it's pretty amazing to be able to talk to you all at once. Uh, I look forward to your questions. The program I'm doing is called the Private Sector Innovation Program for Health, or PSP4H. It's in Kenya, and we're funded by the UK government's DFID. Our mandate is to explore the markets in which poor people pay for-profit providers and shopkeepers for health care. That's a new area for DFID Kenya. DFID has over 100 million pounds of healthcare programming in Kenya. We're the only program using the market systems approach that actually is giving information back to DFID. So we're actually looking at evidence that will inform future programming. So it's a unique program in that we're a research program. But we're an action research program. Although we do market research and literature research, our budget is primarily targeted towards actually testing innovative business models in the marketplace. So it's an exciting program, and we've been able to publish on our website about 25 briefs, research reports, and other publications in the last year. And when I finish up, I'll give you the link to those. They're all PDFs, and they're freely downloadable. One of our mandates is to provide evidence for and, and disseminate information about market systems and health, because it's pretty much a, a, a desert when it comes to prior information. Our primary target is a group that's known as the working poor. Um, it's not the social poor below the poverty line that cannot pay for health. And it's also not the middle class and upper middle class that can access virtually any health service. But in Kenya, that low income group we're talking about makes up about half the population, and they spend about half of the money in the health sector in Kenya. So that's 22 million people making up about half the health spending in Kenya. And to reemphasize, we do use the M4P approach and provide evidence through the DCED measurement standard back to DFID. Now I just want to give you a little Venn diagram of our domain because this defines us as different from other health programs. Uh, we're pro-poor. But I think a lot of development programs are pro-poor, but, but again, not every program. There are, for example, there are health sector competitiveness programs that actually end up developing the sector, but the benefit lies at the top end, not at the bottom end. So we're distinctly pro-poor targeted. Second, again, we deal with the private sector. That just means we don't deal directly with the government on health provision. 
And thirdly, we deal with the for-profit private sector. As Thomas pointed out, there are a lot of not-for-profit actors in the private sector. So our, our distinct domain is the intersection of, of these three. We're pro-poor, we're private sector, but we deal with the for-profit sector. Let me give you three examples of interventions we're working with, because you may wonder, well, what am I talking about? Here's an example in the pharmaceutical supply chain. We're working with the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association to put together a branded network of private retail pharmacies under a common brand. And the back door to that is a supply chain that only accesses quality medicines. The problem we're solving is that there are 7,000 pharmacies in Kenya, but only 3,000 are actually licensed and registered. The PharmNet is an intervention in the pharmaceutical supply chain. We're working with the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association, which represents the pharmaceutical technologists in Kenya, and all the members are licensed and registered. The problem we're dealing with is that in Kenya, <clears throat> there are 7,000 drug sellers, but only about 3,000 are licensed. So we've got a huge problem with, with uh, quacks, if you will. And then in, in the drug supply chain itself, about 30% of medicines nationwide are substandard. The idea behind PharmNet is to link together the licensed practitioners into a network under a common brand. Because if you come out of your house in a low-income neighborhood, you don't know right now if the drug seller is licensed or not. PharmNet is a clear signal that this is a licensed pharmacy. Second, we're backing it up with, with the supply chain that taps into only quality assured medicines from, from free qualified suppliers. So if you go to a PharmNet, you know you're getting real drugs. So that's the concept. Already there are over 100 pharmacies in the network. And we're very excited about this. Another sample inter intervention is in healthcare finance. Um, we're working with a company called Jawabu with a product called Afiapoa. And it's a low cost health insurance slash health savings product targeted towards the informal worker. Now, why is that important? In, in Kenya, over 80% of workers are in the informal sector. And insurance coverage only really covers the formal sector, and, and it barely dips into the informal sector. When you get into the informal sector, coverage is, is under, well, it's, it's under 10%. It's in single digits. We're working with Jawabu with a combination inpatient insurance program and a self-funded self health savings uh, complement. And that's underway right now. We're working with provider networks. We're working with the Jew Akali or, or the workers' associations as well as with the company. So we can both work on, on the demand and, and the provider side uh, with this product. And another example of private sector intervention is in maternal and newborn health. In Western Kenya, where access to skilled delivery is quite low, on the order of 40% of women uh, use skilled delivery, which means the majority of women del deliver without assistance in Western Kenya. We're working to network a group of private community midwives. Each of them are, are entrepreneurs to provide better services. Uh, we're working with creating the network, helping them market their services, bringing their skills up to a, a common level, and then networking them in with, with facilities that can help them in cases of complication. And the hope there is that we can have more women in Western Kenya actually have skilled delivery. So those are three examples of, of things we're actually doing with the private sector. Now, our program, when it first started out, was under question if, if M4P would even work in the health sector. There are a lot of questions. Everyone thinks their sector is different. The health sector is different. It's complex. There are various reasons M4P won't work. So we were actually at a test on behalf of DIFA to see if, if M4P even had validity. Now, I'm going to quote you from DIFA's annual review of the program. They basically agree that our first year experiences at M4P in health is a valid approach for technical assistance to the for-profit private healthcare sector. So our initial experience validated M4P in, in health. Uh, basically, Second finding is that M4P as a framework applies to health. We don't need to fundamentally change the M4P framework to use it in the health sector. The attributes of being pro-poor, facilitative light touch, a systematic approach, uh, sustainable from the beginning, scalable, 
All those aspects of M4P apply to health. We don't need a different framework. At the same time, we definitely need to contextualize what we're doing. There's, healthcare is a complex ecosystem, and we have to be part of a comprehensive strategy. And I'll show you a slide about that. Uh, at, at first, we really entered the market talking about the private sector. And we found there wasn't much understanding in Kenya that, that healthcare is actually an ecosystem. And, and the ecosystem, as has been pointed out by my colleagues, consists of public sector delivery, public-private partnerships, and private sector delivery. Now, to overlay the M4FP framework on that of, of who does and who pays, basically, to simplify things, in the public sector, the public sector pays, the public sector does. It's public money, public provision. In a public-private partnership, public sector pays, but the private sector executes. And in the private sector, private sector pays, private sector does. What we found the sweet spot for M4P down at the bottom. It's, it's in private sector healthcare delivery, and it, it gets up into certain types of public-private partnerships. But we're only looking at one part of the ecosystem, and, and it has to be acknowledged that all the players have to be active in the system for it to function. Now, what are some key differences between healthcare and other sectors? Um, we've identified four key differences. First, healthcare is often characterized as a public good and a human right. So, healthcare has a, has a heavy public image compared to a lot of other sectors. Okay, second, Public sector is often a significant market player and service provider as well as regulator. That, that doesn't happen in a lot of other sectors. So you, you'll find in Kenya, for example, the health spending is about 62% private, 38% public. The public provides a lot of service. So the public is clearly a market player. Third, and Thomas pointed this out, NGOs and FBOs play significant roles in healthcare provision. So when we talk about the private sector, we're actually subdividing the private sector into commercial and not-for-profit segments. And again, PSP4H is primarily looking at the commercial segment. And finally, donors are heavily involved in the health sector. For example, in Kenya, about 30% of the federal Ministry of Health budget is provided by donors. And also in health, you'll find external agendas. So global agendas tend to dominate. One more point I didn't put on the slide, but the healthcare value chain is quite complex. So you've got a complex value chain compared to other market systems where M4P is used. That doesn't mean you can't use M4P. It just means that it's more painstaking to map the value chain, but it, it can be done. So what are some initial lessons? First of all, before you intervene, map the sector well. In, in Kenya, we found 273 donor health programs about a year ago. So donor projects and health proliferate. Uh, typically, they use direct intervention. They, have, they provide goods, they provide subsidies, they provide grants. So there's a lot of uh, donor distortion in the health market. And when donors intervene directly, that tends to crowd the private commercial sector out. What we found, though, is at first there's some trepidation. Can we actually act in such a donor-crowded segment? Y yes, you can. Because what we found is that donor projects tend to cluster in areas driven by global agendas. And when we went and talked to beneficiaries, we found all kinds of areas that had no donor provision. So even though there are a lot of donor projects, they're all in the same areas. Uh, but if you want to be effective with market systems programming, it works best in areas that, where we don't compete with donor subsidy. Why? We don't have to have expensive money compete with, with basically free donor money. We don't have to compete with subsidy. Second, as I mentioned earlier, speak directly with low-income consumers. Uh, health agendas tend to be globally driven, so they're often top-down. We found by speaking with consumers and asking questions like, what's your path to treatment? What's your health-seeking behavior? Where do you go? Who do you see? Why do you do that? What's your health-spending behavior? How much do you spend for a consultation? How much do you save for health? All those questions help identify where to intervene with, with a market systems program. And also, ultimately, what health needs in market segments are unserved or underserved. We work in six areas. In, in we look in a, at a market systems area rather, rather than a health outcome. So we look, for example, at e-health and m-health, you know, mobile solutions. We look at healthcare finance. We look at low-cost delivery models. 
maternal and newborn health, uh, non-communicable diseases, and pharmaceutical supply chain. Those are the six market areas that PSP4H has found plenty of room to operate. Frankly, we've got about a dozen interventions going, and we started with about 150 potential ideas. So getting into the program has become like getting into Oxford. So it's like one in 12 actually gets in. So there's a lot of demand for development of, of the commercial sector. And, and again, at first, DIFA didn't know. They didn't know if there'd be any demand for this program at all. But there, there's plenty of demand. We, we actually you know, have a robust pipeline, and, and we reject many more potential projects for, for not meeting our criteria than we accept. Uh, but we found market systems programming works best in these areas. And I gave you examples of supply chain, maternal health, uh, and healthcare finance that we're actually working with now. Overall partner engagement is the key. M4P is an analytical technique, uh, and we have well analyzed the market, but if you can't engage a partner who's willing to invest, you don't have an intervention. So we, we found that it's, it's beneficial to go with existing initiatives and support early adopters, as opposed to creating initiatives and convincing partners they need to take our approach. We've also found that a lot of leverage exists through networks. We found that networks overlap. For example, provider networks overlap with health finance networks. Uh, supply chain overlaps with provider networks. So networks overlap, and then network effects are key to scale up. Most of our programs have scale up designed into them. We're not doing you know, 1C, 2Z pilots. Um, and, and finally, we avoid using money to create incentives. Uh, we do not give grants. PSP4H is a pure technical assistance program. And we, we come to cooperative agreements with our partners, and we, we act as a consulting firm for them. Overall, and I think you know this, the benefits of using a market systems approach in health are, first of all, sustainability by design. We don't come in after the fact and say, our funding is ending. How do we make it market sustainable? We have to design sustainability into the program. We do that by partnering with commercial players. Hello everyone. I will be uh, talking to you on the experience of Madea Consortium implementing um, SOMAP, Support to National Malaria Control Program, that is DFID funded in Nigeria. Uh, the program is has been in operation since 2008 um, in the country and it's a program that is looking at a comprehensive approach to increasing or uh, reducing the burden of malaria in Nigeria. As we all know, uh, the burden of malaria in Nigeria is very huge. I'm talking about a situation in which 97% of the population of people in Nigeria are at risk for the disease, and in which the disease is responsible for 30% of under 5 mortality and it accounts for over 100 million cases that are clinically diagnosed, 60% uh, of which are uh, from the outpatient visit. And you could see that this uh, relates very uh, closely with the presentation of, of uh, the earlier presenter of the uh, the proportion of health services that are taking place in the private sector. To demonstrate uh, further the burden of the disease in Nigeria, 26% um, uh, of death of attributed malaria do take place in Nigeria and uh, put together between Nigeria, DRC, Congo, Ethiopia and Uganda are responsible for 50% of deaths globally. But with this scenario that I painted, um, long-lasting sectoral net has been proven by WHO and other partners as one major preventive tool that can be used to reduce the burden of malaria. And what I mean here, the difference between LLIN and the traditional uh, mosquito net is that these nets have had insecticide impregnated into the fabric in the industry, I mean the, in the factory, and the insecticide can still remain potent even after at least 20 washes. And this has been proven uh, scientifically to still be effective. So in essence, apart from providing 
the insecticide killing mosquitoes, repelling mosquitoes. It also provides a physical barrier between mosquito and the mother and the children sleeping on that mosquito. In Nigeria alone, uh, in 10 years, between 2000 and 2010, uh, LLIN has saved over 900,000 lives and uh, in 2006, till date, it has prevented three quarters of deaths due to malaria. So, in summary, LLIN as the malaria too. But I guess the question we need to ask ourselves and work. If we want to ask these questions, then we have to go amongst ourselves and now be talking about what are the various opportunity or approaches that is available to us to improve uh, the market of LLIN. And I'll take you through the different types of approaches that uh, um, is, is, is being talked about. One is the public health approach, in which there's a mass distribution of LLIN uh, um, supported by social uh, subsidized social marketing, and this is also uh, complemented by routine distribution to the vulnerable groups. The high side of this strategy, uh, of this supply-driven strategy, is that with the strategy you could quickly achieve universal coverage of LLIN, which from a public health perspective, it is essential to break the transmission of malaria. But it has the downside. And these are the challenges of weak public sector capacity to ensure distribution uh, on time and to prevent leakage of these free nets into the commercial market. But we also know that this mode of distribution of net can easily crowd out the private sector from the retail market and then incentivize the informal sector, uh, restricting even manufacturers to send only to the public sector institution. The second approach I will uh, talk about is about the uh, private sector approach, which is demand-driven, uh, which basically is about retail sales to consumers based on their demand. And this has, the high side of this is that it's sustainable in absence of donor fund uh, that is mainly used to do the public sector distribution. But the high cost is, is making it a, a bit limited in terms of achieving coverage, and LLI is not purely uh, household good. Uh, it also has some need for some education on appropriate usage and quality assurance and regulation, which requires a qualified information to complement, uh, apart from just buying the materials. The third model is a mix of the supply and demand, uh, which is a mix of push and pull. And this is talking about starting off with a mass distribution through public sector, complementing that with the consumer-driven private sector, and then still keep some supply to the vulnerable groups in society. The good side of this, and it has more good side, is that it buys time for the private sector to mature. As the demand increases from the public sector distribution, the cost of production goes down the market itself mature and the private sector can drive uh, and, and make use uh, and ride on this to make sure the, the market is sustainable. It can also ensure equitable and sustainable large impact, as I talked about on the public health, but also uh, in, in terms of uh, the interaction between the public sector and the private sector. But the downside of this is how do you achieve the right mix uh, of this uh, bringing together the supply and the demand side. So theoretically, what I'm trying to say is that what we want to achieve from a public sector perspective is to achieve a universal coverage. But in reality, based on what I said earlier, this sometimes might not be achieved. The 
but in this in the scenario that this cannot be achieved, uh, universal coverage cannot be achieved. It isn't even more. It's even worse when they are, there is a dysfunctioning formal commercial market that cannot sustain and sometimes increase coverage of the line, uh, the coverage that the public sector is attempting to achieve. So for some strategy we have adopted in increasing the commercial sector, uh, commercial sales of NET is in four phases. One is to stimulate consumer demand for LLIN and two, to support the local importers and distributors to look at niche channels for their commercial distribution and three, to now encourage harmonization between commercial, the private sector and the public sector looking at the issues of how they affect each other. I'm talking about the issues of leaks and fake nets as it's affecting the commercial sector. And the fourth one is to correct the production of airline, which now can respond to local needs and preferences of consumers uh, that are in it. Here, it didn't come with zero challenges. We have our achievements. We have our challenges and we have our conclusions. The key challenge achievement we've made is that in two years we've sold over six hundred thousand LLN. We have ensured sustained engagement of four LLI importers and distributors. And in early next quarter, we'll be having the production of the very first uh, UPS approved airline in country. And private sector has been included as part of the current National Malaria Elimination Strategic Program for the entire country. The leakage of nets has continued to be a challenge, and the implementation of the national strategy for scale up of airline has also been challenged. The reduction, the global production of LLI as many countries are reducing and completing their national nationwide campaign is also a challenge for country supply, which we think the in-country production of LLI will really, really help us to address. So how have we been coping? The strategies we have deployed in coping with the uh, challenges include regular monitoring and updating and previous organizers uh, have also um, uh, alluded to this in the sense that we need to provide uh, information about the market, share this with our donor, share this with our staff, but also share with the players in the market for us to quickly respond to any constraint that is affecting the market. We've also invested a lot in our staff, uh, in their capacity for market analysis, intervention designing, uh, partnership management, and monitoring. Next. The summary of all this is that in terms of moving forward, our experience has confirmed our our impression and our strategy that to develop the market of LLI in Nigeria, it requires a pluralistic approach. And not only uh, the pluralistic approach of having all um, the different types of distribution, but also to be able to determine the right mix of how these uh, two distribution of LLI can coexist. We are not only applying this strategy for LLI market alone. We are also uh, rolling it out for the market around anti-malaria, uh, ACT, um, which is at a misnamed based combination therapy to treat malaria. And in this way, specifically, we have rolled on the global uh, 
um, subsidy to crash the price of this anti-malaria to extend it to the rural market uh, to increase its access. Malaria Consortium is using all these learnings uh, as a way of putting together the best way to develop health markets uh, in, as part of its contribution to increasing the quality of care for malaria control. More of our experience can be seen from our website, uh, Malaria Consortium website, but also and some of them are linked to all the appropriate uh, networks that we work with, including DFID. In this work, we've worked with some technical partners, which include uh, Innovision and also include Montrose, which are our technical partners. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for questions. We've been asked as well if, if the recording will be sent out and the presentations will be sent out, so we'll ensure if, if any of you experience a bad connection, we're sure quite shortly we email out the presentation and, and the content around it. Um, great questions. Please, please keep sending them in. I, I've got one um, a nice comment before I kind of ask you uh, a couple questions, uh, Tom. I really like this from a couple, a couple comments from Robert Smith who says, uh, he reviewed Malaria Consortium's M M4P um, excellent work on Lynn this summer and he can say the following, that the relative cost of working with the market is very low compared to working with public sector facilities and the potential value for money is consequently very high. But the market was not addressing the market potential at all, despite the opportunities that malaria prevention presents, so that a mass donor funded campaign was essential to realize the public benefits, the health benefits, pardon me. But in doing so, the mass market largely destroyed the market. So, so he kind of agrees there that Maxwell is very right to suggest a coordinated approach that prepares for the end of a mass campaign is essential as donor support does finish. And, and thanks very much for that comment. Uh, what I want to do is I, I want to, um, a couple of questions kind of before we go into other questions came over to you, Tom. I think we probably have a time for two rounds of questions for every, everyone. And the first questions were kind of about the evidence of, of, of is the, the first steps and the evidence around the role of the um, of the private sector in, in markets. So, um, for instance, Tommaso Tabet asks, is there evidence that a private run health health posts, uh, post lower level in health, mm. is there a private, is there evidence that a private run health posts, lower level in a health system, brings more efficiency and quality? And similarly, Moka Yamayani asks that she, that for some reference, some peer reviewed studies on the success of the market in providing quality service to poor people. So, uh, so Tom, could you could you kick us off by, by answering those questions? Sure, absolutely. And uh, they are the million dollar questions, unfortunately. Um, the short answer to these questions is that we simply don't have the evidence at the moment to draw any significant conclusions around the comparative efficiency of private versus public providers. And I just want to give you an illustration of why that is. Um, in the last three years, there's been two systematic reviews, one in 2011, the other in 2012, looking at all of the available evidence on the quality and efficiency of public versus private health service provision. And those two systematic reviews came to completely different conclusions, one supporting the public sector as being more efficient and the other supporting the private sector. Now, part of the challenge when you do a study and a comparative study like that is that you need comparative data from both public and private sectors and that your data uh, rules out or acknowledges the factors arising from the differences in patients, the differences in training and resource availability when you do your analysis. So in other words, you can't compare an untrained private provider in a small rural clinic with a fully trained public doctor in a well-equipped hospital. And interestingly, when you look at those two systematic reviews and the 182 publications that they looked at, only one publication actually meets the criteria in taking those factors into account um, because it looked at how the same patient was treated by different providers. Now, interestingly, that study suggested that you do tend to get more patient-centered care in the private sector but it found no significant difference in treatment accuracy between public and private providers. So the conclusion really is we, we still need a lot more research in this area. 
Um, if you're interested in those two systematic reviews I just referred to, they are on the Health Systems Hub. Um, you just go to the Regulation and Quality Assurance topic in Learn, and you will see them there. Um, and it's worth, I just want to finish answering that question by saying, you know, the Markets for Health framework does not advocate one public or one private approach over the other. Really, it is a tool for governments and other actors to use to determine how they can best collaborate and in which areas um, governments can leverage the private sector effectively to improve access, affordability, equity. It all depends on your outcome. Okay, thanks. thanks very much. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions specifically on the leveraging of the, of the private sector for Kalawali. So Dolapo uh, Olusamamukun, who, who recently wrote a blog, a great blog for the, for the Beam Exchange, asks specifically what kind of support has Sunmap given a four local importers and distributors of LIN in Nigeria? Um, access to finance, technical assistance, or a mix? And, and taking a broader perspective of, of the private sector in Nigeria, uh, Zanoye Durabani asks, in the presence of a public, act, public sector actors and NGOs who are heavily subsidized by donor funds, how would a private companies running their business, if not through a challenge fund or through their CSR? Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. These are very interesting questions. Um, I will start with the last one, talking about the presence of subsidy and how uh, private sector are running their businesses. Um, I will use LLIN as a case study uh, from my presentation. And as I mentioned there, we, the way the public distribution has gone is that donor and uh, government are distributing specific limited color, specific sizes of LLIN to the household and using one strategy. So our strategy is to engage the private sector to agree with them to carve a niche market for themselves. For example, can they sell different shapes of LLIN and can they sell to different consumers like hotels, like boarding schools. Like, so these are the kind of support that we are providing for them. And this is actually working to keep their business going while uh, the social life of the nets that are distributed through public sector uh, disappears and there's need for replacement of LLIN. To answer the second question, we provided a combination of support, both access to finance, technical support, and, and, and even uh, technical support in terms of trade, uh, how to improve their capacity to, to trade, open their supply chain, be innovative in their thinking, test out uh, some new markets and seeing lessons that have been learned and support them to scale up this for not only to scale up in the market but things that are common we, is shared among all uh, bigger practitioners I mean other uh, players within the market but also use that as an opportunity to, to entice and invite other players into that market for the purpose of expanding the market. So that's how we have worked and uh, it's case by case although the constraints that we discover from the market might look similar, but the location of the consumer makes it specific. And so we, we, we actually sit down with each of the distributors in their local markets and identify with them their local and specific constraints and how we, we can help them and jointly together work to overcome these constraints. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I, a number of you are, are, are sending in questions, very interesting questions, quite some of fairly provocative, shall we say, questions in for Ron. And unfortunately, we are still trying to find him, and I think we probably won't get him by the time of this webinar, but I, I will endeavor to keep this conversation going and, and to put those questions in front of him, probably through our, through our LinkedIn page. Um, another question has come in um, from Zuzuneid Rabani, which I will just find which I'm going to send over to, to Tom. He asked, uh, uh, sorry, this was a previous question. So this is from Robert Zawa who asked Tom, um, it would be great to know how Handship is addressing the challenge of conflicting donor approaches to market systems within the health systems. For instance, he gives, he asked, the market systems for micronutrients. Can you answer that one? 
Uh, I'll do my best, yes. Um, good question. I think we're all familiar with the challenges of um, donor alignment and the duplication and lack of coordination that can sometimes be seen at different levels. Um, a couple of things I'd say. Um, one of the reasons, as I said, that we started Handship in the first place was to specifically try and align better these donor approaches. Now, um, back in 2010, when Handship started, the, there was very little known about the private sector, um, even less than today. And there was a very different mix of experience among the Handship member agencies. So, for example, um, the USAID had quite a number of years working with private actors already in health, but other agencies uh, were only just starting out. And it was important to set up this group as a way of learning from each other so that they didn't go out and make the same mistakes again. Um, now, the Handship group at the moment is um, quite a high-level, headquarters-level group um, that focuses on policy alignment. Um, but it's also um, exploring a number of different programmatic interventions at the country level. Um, and co-financing, as I said, between different members, um, different areas and different programs that will generate new knowledge and research and evidence in this area to help inform their strategy. Um, it's, it's also about stimulating a place, I think, for discussion of these issues. For a long time, the private sector was a taboo word within health systems discussions. And as Rodden mentioned, it's, it's very strongly viewed um, health as a public good. Um, but I think now the question has changed from should we work with the private sector to how do we work with the private sector, especially in the context of the sustainable development goals that are coming up later this year. So, I mean, donor agencies are definitely not the experts in this. Um, but groups like Handship do include developing country governments from India, Rwanda, and Nigeria, who uh, have gone quite far down the path of analyzing and engaging the private sector. And it's through this joint learning that, that there is starting to be some real alignment in terms of how these agencies approach um, health system markets. Um, I think there is also more evidence available to these donors now of the impacts of historical interventions, such as um, mass campaign for mosquito LLIN nets, uh, which have had unintended negative consequences in different contexts. So these donors are all quite interested now about how they can start to shape market, markets in the long term using things like the Markets for Health program framework, uh, rather than just doing direct interventions. Thanks, Ashley. Okay, thanks very much. Um, there have been some more, more questions in for Ron, and we'll just have to keep those. So thanks for all of those. I think the last question, question that we are sending out, and this goes to, to, to both of our, our panelists here, is, is from Natalie Scala Diffid. Um, so Ron mentioned that his program targets for working poor. What has been the experience of a panel in reaching the most excluded group groups, e.g. rural poor, with, with these market based models where the ability to pay may be very low? Is that something perhaps you, you can answer, Kolewele? Thank you, Ashley. I, I will attempt. Um, I think it's, it's very, very challenging to reach the poor um, that are very, very poor. Um, as you know, um, some poor can just not afford, um, no matter how little the market has gone in terms of price of the commodity. And uh, when I was advocating mixed model, that's why we still kept the channel uh, to cover the vulnerable and the very poor. But what uh, our experience in Nigeria about this market also is that we have tried to engage uh, the dynamics the reality of the dynamics of the market and work with the, the sensibilities of the of the culture. We have in some parts of the country in which the, it's part of the culture for the middle class to procure some public good, what they are seen as public good, for their relatives in the village that are, that are seen seemingly poor. So some of our engagement has been with these middle class people and make 
then see the reason why it is important not only for you to sleep under the net, but it is important for everyone, including the very, very poor people in the village. And that has seemed to, to work. So it means that the, your primary audience, in terms of people that buy the commodity, are the middle class that can afford it. But when they buy, they buy what they need, but they also buy for their for relatives that don't have that much to buy. And this is how uh, some of them have been covered. This has been our experience in, in Nigeria. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks, and Tom? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the ways that Hanshep has been approaching this through the programs that it's put in place um, is based on research that shows the enormous fragmentation of the providers that are serving the poor. Um, they are very difficult to reach. They are informal providers that work outside um, the public sector and under the radar a lot of the time. They're not regulated or or monitored in that sense. So one of the ways that Hanship is trying to address this um, is through organizing those fragmented markets by looking at the incentives for individual pharmacists to, for example, uh, link up through networks. So there's two example programs I'll just refer to quickly and there's more information on these um, on the Hanship website. One is that uh, we have supported the creation of the Rwanda Healthcare Federation. Uh, which is a private sector representative body which is designed to uh, act as a focal point for all the private providers within operating within Rwanda and therefore make it easier for the government to engage and work with them as a body um, as opposed to this heavily fragmented market. Um, another program that we completed last year was a research program looking at the incentives for different providers informal providers in Nigeria to start to refer effectively to each other and operate more as a, um, a collective coherent system than a totally fragmented market because that's not serving the poor at all and they need trust that they're getting the right treatment at the right point in the system. So there are a number of ways that you can approach this but um, take a look at the Hanship website for more details. Thanks Ashley. Okay, well, thanks very much. I think we'll, we'll uh, close down the, the webinar there. Can I ask if I could get any final comments from either of our, either of our two presenters? Perhaps Kodawolo first. Um, I'll jump in quickly. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I think it's awesome. uh, I'd like to thank you and everyone that has participated. And as most uh, all the presenters have, have mentioned, the system is is very important and is key. And it's it's um, there's no one size that fits all. We all have to continue to to learn and see the appropriate mix mix that is important to sustain the, the markets in, in which we work. I also think that it's it's as we work on this is actually driving the question uh, from the public sector perspective, I'm talking about this stewardship role of government to start engaging that in terms of the role of government for the health of its people to be clearly defining it more about what role specifically that they, they want private sector to play here. And here I'm talking about not only organized private sector as we know it now, but for us to go a little bit further to be able to look at private sector in its ramifications, both organized and uh, non-organized. Thank you. Yes, um, I'd just like to finish by emphasizing the absolute pivotal importance of better quality evidence and data collection um, around health markets. Um, as you can see, there's been a lot of health policy that's made on the basis of ideology or rhetoric or stereotypes um, around public versus private. And we simply don't have a comprehensive evidence base yet to really understand what the best balance between these two kinds of providers is. Um, so the reason why we created the Health Systems Hub uh, is really as a meeting place to start to bring together all of the best quality research and evidence, reports, videos, uh, training frameworks such as M4H and M4P 
so that people can actually start to really make evidence-based decisions and also identify the areas that they want to do more research in. But I think this has been a great webinar. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate, and I hope, uh, hope to see you all on the Health Systems Hub soon. Ron, I believe you've come back, so do you want to provide a final word as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, know, I know an internet service provider is probably going to get fired tomorrow, but uh, maybe I was too soon to thank the technology for working, because mine didn't cooperate too well. Uh, from the PSP4H point of view, what's really important is that we don't just look at external health agendas, that we actually talk to the people that are not getting served. And I think we'll find there are huge unserved areas for low-income populations. Now, working in Kenya, uh, we, we found that there are a lot of areas that are served by this total markets approach, but there are other areas that the public sector doesn't touch at all. And a good example is non-tunicable disease. Uh, virtually an epidemic worldwide, but if you go into the low-income areas of Nairobi, there's no treatment whatsoever for uh, diabetes, uh, for hypertension, things that are very commonplace. So I encourage those in health programming to look at areas that, that are underserved from the customer's point of view. And it's very beneficial to look at the market system from the access point of view. If you talk to the low-income consumer, when they need health care, how do they actually access it? And that may give you a different result than if you look at it in terms of global health agendas. So we found a, a fruitful area to work in using the M4P approach in health, and, and we encourage others in, in the center to look at the same type of program in the future. And again, even though I had some terrible tech problems, I want to thank you for letting us participate. Uh, please go to the PSP4H website. It's just psp4h.com. There's a resource center, and we've got about 25 different publications that are all under a year old, giving some of the evidence that Thomas was talking about. So we're trying to populate that area. We're working hard to give evidence and document not only approaches, but, but outcomes and impacts using the market systems approach. So th thank you for letting me participate. So thanks very much. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close the webinar. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for your, your very active participation and the great questions. Uh, we very much hope that you could gain some ideas about market systems approaches to the health sector that are relevant for your work. As there was an overwhelming number of questions, we couldn't answer all of them. And uh, we will aim to answer more as a follow-up to this webinar on the Beam LinkedIn group, so stay tuned. Ron, in particular, you had a number of questions coming away from, uh, from I think, from Mary Aki, from Bruce McKay, from Roger Oakley, and, and from a, a, a number of people that have some quite pertinent questions for you. Um, can I ask that people participate as well in the short survey? You will find the URL in, in the chat box. Uh, I'd like to highlight as well some further resources that, that delve into the application of market systems approaches in the health sector. Uh, as you cannot click the links in the slide, we have been posting them into the chat box so you can directly click on them. The Handshep website, as mentioned, includes a range of documents relating to Handshep research on the work of non-state actors in healthcare more broadly and links to relevant organizations. The Health Systems Hub has been specially designed to support knowledge exchange, networking and collaboration among global health practitioners. The PSP 4 H Resource Center includes a range of valuable research reports and briefs on health markets in East Africa. And while the LinkedIn group N4P in Health provides a space for discussion between professionals working in the health sector using the M4P approach. Beam has also developed itself a page on market systems approaches in the health sector, while there are also a great deal of resources on market system approaches on the Beam website more broadly, so I would encourage you to visit it and sign up for more information. Last but not least, I would also like to thank our three presenters for introducing us to the topic and sharing their experience with us. We hope that you enjoyed this event and we wish you a great rest of your day. Thanks very much.